Hey, it's Ron McLean, Hockey Night in Canada and Rogers Hometown Hockey, and welcome to the Sean Newman Podcast. Welcome to the Sean Newman Podcast. Today, I'm joined by the iconic Ron McLean. So first off, thank you for joining me. Total pleasure, Sean, and uh, glad to follow in Kelly Rudy's footsteps. It's kind of cool that you had Kelly on, who's a, a very dear friend, of course, and uh, we're all going back to work, although we're social distancing, not six feet. We're going to social distance from 3,000 kilometers because Kelly's going to start at home in Calgary and join us in the studios here in Toronto that way. Well, before we get into your story, Ron, I just want to give a couple of quick shout outs. Um, a, you're the 100th guest, so we're recording it a couple days early, but you are my 100th, so that's it's a big um, achievement for myself. Mm -hmm. uh, really excited about it. Was really excited. I, I got two quick stories. Well, the shout out first is to, you know, Justin Mapletop. I don't know if that name rings a bell for you. And uh, Frank. Yeah, sure. Of course. It, it's funny how the world works, but I interviewed him, you know, months and months and months ago. And he led me to Colby Armstrong and Colby Armstrong led me to Carly Agro and Carly Agro led me to yourself. It's just funny how, you know, you, I didn't, See, I didn't know how to get to you, and slowly it just kind of worked, and, and here we sit. So I just want to extend a real sense of gratitude to all those people for making this happen. This is a, a real dream come true of mine. I've watched you for a long time. Um, and so I guess it's, it's super cool how uh, connecting with people has, has led me to you, and I'm sure you have your own stories on that, but uh, that part, super cool. And then the second part is, when I found out about you coming on, I was uh, coming back from an interview with Ryan Papuano, the coach of the Brooks Bandits, and we were down visiting some friends in uh, Bow Island, Alberta, which is just southwest yeah. of Medicine Hat. And when I found out about you, Ron, I pulled over, did about eight fist pumps, and I'm sure people thought I was a little bit crazy on the side of the road. That's like when we were at the Olympics in 2002. Uh, one of the games was played in Provo, Utah. So the bulk of the games were in Salt Lake City, of course, but Canada played the German game over in Provo. And we were driving to Provo, which is, I don't know, an hour from uh, Salt Lake City. And Grapes, I mean, you could spot him a mile away. He's like a grain elevator with those collars, right? So people were, all the Canadians who were going out to the game would see Don in the passenger seat of my vehicle, and they were going ballistic and opening their windows and mooning us and doing whatever they could to celebrate there goes uh, the guys from the, the hockey broadcast so I've been there <laughs> well once again I mean that's a long intro for you but I do really appreciate you coming on uh, what we do here is I really want to hear about your journey everybody you know has watched you for years and years and years and I'm always curious on hard work the the lessons the everything that goes into, you know, becoming Ron McLean, the guy who's on Coach's Corner, host of Hockey Night in Canada for years upon years, and everybody's, you know, just, you're the iconic guy. And I guess I just, I want to go right to the beginning, right back to the start. Uh, I know you were born in Germany, but I, I think there's a little bit more to the story there. And maybe we could just start with your parents and, and work our way. I, I think that's, you know, when I think about your what you mentioned off the top of the three names that kind of got you to me, the six degrees of separation, Carly Agro's mom is an incredible human being. Uh, and the twin sisters, you know, Carly obviously got her start at Lloyd. Um, she's an incredible mentor and matriarch of that family. Uh, Frank Mapletoft, of course, I see uh, often at the Calgary Stampede. And as I don't have to tell you, was a great friend of Byron McCrimmon and uh, the great, you know, Border Kings teams in the 1960s. And uh, I got to see, of course, his son play for the Red Deer Rebels. So that was kind of a cool kick. Uh, and then Colby Armstrong's mom, uh, figure skating instructor. So when Colby helped us on a show called Battle of the Blades, uh, Rosemary was a brilliant figure skating instructor and is one of the reasons Colby knew to say, you know, we call that stroking <laughs> rather than skating or striding, uh, which is like kind of strange for a farm boy from Saskatoon and Lloyd Minster, right, to know that, but that's because of his great mom. And you're, you're right, my parents, uh, I mean, honestly, Sean, I, I'll never figure out how I ended up on Hockey Net in Canada. No ambition to get into broadcasting whatsoever. I wanted to be a teacher. Uh, I was an only child, and I, I really revered mom and dad. I got to do adult conversation from the get-go, no siblings, so I was, you know, kind of on a higher level of conversation just because I had no brothers and sisters to yak with. I had friends, but a lot of the conversation became adult early in my life, so I think that accounts a little bit for uh, 
you know, the gift of the gab. Uh, both were uh, extremely conscientious. My father had a rough, you know, sort of story. He was adopted. He was, he was basically cast adrift uh, as a child. His father's from Newfoundland uh, and he uh, got involved with a maid in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia and dad was produced and then the guy disappeared and then the mother couldn't afford or was, you know, it was an illegitimate child, bad thing back in the day. So dad was in foster homes and kicked around until he was about 13. And yet he was a beautiful human being. Like he had such faith in uh, life. Uh, and he was obviously a doting dad because he'd been through the ringer. Uh, so I was lucky on that side to have unconditional love from my father. And my mom was as sharp as a pistol, but very, uh, she went into the convent for two years, was studying to be a nun. Uh, wasn't for her, um, but she was that kind of a person, like a really thought about others more than herself. She was the kind of person that people would speak to willingly. I, I used to be amazed at how people would sit at our kitchen table in Red Deer and within minutes, you know, their life story is pouring into my mother's care. So I was just lucky. She was a strict, super strict, uh, you know, with with because I was a yakky kid. Being an only child, I was maybe spoiled. Uh, but they were great parents. Uh, Ron and Lila are their names. Both went into the military to a escape kind of a poor upbringing in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. Uh, they suffered, mom suffered no fools gladly, dad definitely suffered fools gladly. So we were, I was always thought I'm a lucky mix of my mom and dad in the sense that, you know, as an example, working with a guy like Grapes, my mom would kind of say, you know, got to rein him in, Ronnie. And my dad would say, oh, it's funny, you know, and uh, they gave me a mix of uh, resolve um, and uh, great empathy and compassion. Did you, uh, did you ever talk to your father about his upbringing? That's, that's a pretty cool story to be kicked around like that and, yeah. and to have an outlook on life such as that. Yeah, well, I think he just felt like it was pennies from heaven, everything that happened uh, once he got to the military. Uh, so he, he got adopted by a family called the McLeans. So that's where he gets his name. His, his name is not really McLean. His father's name was Gail and the mother's name was Moulton. And ironically, the drummer for July Talk is a pretty popular rock band right now we're connected through the Moulton family. So I, I don't know my relatives or my background much. It's cr crazy, twisted, typical, you know, small Cape Breton uh, story. Uh, anyway, dad, dad was adopted at 13 and they really, because they needed a worker. He was there to pick apples in their orchard uh, and to shuck uh, crab. Uh, he hated seafood because uh, he worked, you know, over in a plant and also worked in the McLean family orchard. They were nice enough to him, but he tried to run away about 10 times and, it's almost like when I uh, think of Sheldon Kennedy's story, you know, uh, and, and the, the trauma that he went through. And then to see him now, you know, I, I liken to my dad's experience. Dad somehow <laughs> came through hell and uh, it ended up being just the most, you know, once in a blue moon, he would have a streak of bitterness that I think connected to that crazy childhood. Uh, like he might get mad at neighbors who didn't reciprocate if they had them over 10 times for uh, supper or something and they didn't, you know, there would be a moment where dad might. That, that's a human attribute. That's a human attribute. And, and it's a very, you know, that was the, but it was very rare in dad. Dad almost never snapped. Uh, he was endlessly joyous. Uh, I remember the, taking him to the hospital just before he died and he was 93 years old. He went in for a routine biopsy to see if he had cancer and a cyst on his uh, colon. Uh, and because he was 93 uh, and he was put under, uh, he aspirated, they call it, swallowed on his own spit. That happens. He had a little bit of dementia. And, uh, but I just remember taking him to the hospital and the joyful stride in his step. You know, God knew that he would be gone six days later. Um, so I have a really good memory of uh, my father uh, having that, that smile no matter the circumstance. And uh, mom, on the other hand, <laughs> mom was a little bit prone to depression because she was so sharp. I just think she couldn't drink her travesty straight. She was a, you know, a bit not, not straight laced, she'd drink, but she definitely chose to, to internalize all that ever bothered her. And uh, oh man, she was, a, she was a deep human being. I was really blessed to have, uh, you know, her guidance on uh, many, many situations and, and sometimes her worry. You know, I wore her worry because she's, oh, Ronnie, don't talk so much or don't talk to Mr. Batman that way or anyway. It was isn't great, that, isn't great that all mothers? That's all mothers. Yeah, she used to tell me, I, it, ironically, I can remember Sean when I was young in Red Deer. Uh, I was going over to West Park Elementary, had a rink and I was going to just skate and mom said, you know, Ronnie, put on a helmet. Uh, you know, and she made me wear a mouth guard when I was like <laughs> five or six. I was the only child, right? And so uh, anyway, she was, she was overprotective, no question. Um, but ironically, uh, that night, um, I wasn't there at the time, but uh, a friend got hit, you know, by a puck going behind the net without a helmet on and died. 
Um, what? So, yeah. So I think my mom, you know, she never forgot that. She would, she would warn me endlessly about the, you know, prospects of uh, bad things. And uh, that's a tough, you know, thing to, to do to your child in a way because you, you, you can't suck the risk out of life. Um, but God love her, you know, she, she had one and it's a one shot life. So I could understand. You know, going back to the beginning, um, I appreciate you sharing about your parents. I, I found that very fascinating, um, hmm. just the lives that they lived and uh, the lessons they imparted on you and continued all the way um, throughout their life to do. I find it interesting that you never had the dream of, of doing what you're doing. So that means, A, you're exceptional at it. And because I don't, I, my brain has a hard time uh, linking that together, I guess. Mm -hmm. You just fell into it then? Is that totally. what you're kind of saying? Oh, totally. I was in grade 10, sitting in the backyard. Uh, a buddy of mine at uh, Camille J. LaRouche High School in Red Deer, that was the Catholic or separate school. Uh, a buddy of mine was working part-time. Actually, three of my friends were working part-time at a radio station in Red Deer, just operating. They weren't doing any on-air commentating, but they were physically uh, running the board. Very minimal operating. It was a CBC repeater station, CKRD-FM. So their job was uh, at the top of the hour, uh, CBC would say, we now pause for station identification. This is old time stuff for, uh, <laughs> you have to be old to know what this is about. But anyway, they would say time for station identification and a kid in small towns like Lloydminster and Red Deer, he would flip a bar and then press uh, a cartridge, a, a button that would play a cartridge that would say, this is CKRD 99.9 .9 megahertz in Red Deer, Alberta. And then he would flip the lever and rejoin the CBC network. That's all they did once an hour for nine hours. And the friend uh, who was doing that a guy named Bernie Roth was ill. And he says, Hey, Mr. Smith, the man who ran the station, Martin Smith, phone Ron McLean, my buddy, he can figure that out. And I'm sure he'd appreciate the $3 an hour, 27 bucks. So that's how it started for me. I got the, I, I remember my dad coming to the backyard and saying, Ronnie, there's a Martin Smith from CKRD radio on the line. And I thought, Oh God, am I in the news? You know, was I drinking too much last night? What's happened? <laughs> uh, but anyway, it was just that. And, uh, and then one thing led to another, there were four now of us kids from the Camille school working, uh, every second Sunday, I would work three to midnight. And eventually they asked me to read the news at midnight on that station because they were shy of their Canadian quotient. And eventually they asked me to DJ over on their AM operation. Um, they just saw in me, you know, uh, I guess a bit of responsibility is what, what really they saw. They found somebody dependable uh, and they gave me that gig and it just kept on going through high school. And at the end of grade 12, they offered me the position as the eight to midnight disc. Well, first midnights, but that only lasted like a month. And then I, and I, flipped into eight to midnight, uh, Tuesday through Friday. Then I would do noon to six Saturday and then six in the morning to noon Sunday. It was crazy, you know, working around the clock for uh, $600 a month and loving every minute, except I will say, Sean, I had a lot of anxiety. Like I, I, I would hyperventilate sometimes when I was out on location doing advertising in a store and the DJ would throw it, here's Ron McLean at stereo shop. And I would panic. Um, so I was fighting a little bit of the demons that way that I was, I was just a, scared kid who had no, you know, I always say this, I didn't have much of a competitive gene because of that only child upbringing made me a lousy athlete. I didn't have to compete for anything in my house. So I, I also didn't really know how to defend myself in life. Uh, and when, I, when this started to happen, I thought, Oh my God, you're the only one that's scared, you know, and now we know a lot more about mental health, but anyway, I, I survived it. I, I just kept on, you know, freezing and lots of terrible experiences on the air, but I wanted it so bad. Yeah, I just wanted it so bad that I said, Ronnie, it's either you get through this, uh, this next one. I'll never forget having a panic attack in one of the 60-second uh, uh, hits. And I remember the voice of the DJ back at the main station saying, Ron, are you there? Ron, are you there? And, uh, and I couldn't talk. I was just hyperventilating. And so I now had about 15 minutes to gather myself for the next 60-second on uh, the radio. And I, I just remember thinking, this is, this, this is your career, bud. You either, you either get through this or you're going to have to admit that you're not cut out for this line of work. And it was an awful feeling. I was about 20 years old when that happened. And uh, fricked if I know how I got through it, but somehow I was able to cowboy up and, and get through that, that one. And then I, you know, I learned later, uh, you know, ways of getting yourself out of yourself and uh, deflecting the anxiety. But in the early going, it was, it was totally a self-taught uh, resolution. You know, going back to Bernie Roth, do you ever just look back and, and you probably see this all the time 
Like, what happens if he doesn't get sick? Yeah. I become a teacher. I, I, and, and, you know, one of the things, Sean, for me in my career is like I, I had a contract squabble back in 2002 that CBC let me go. And then, of course, Strombo took over in 2014. And uh, I was kind of I wasn't let go per se, but I was kind of on the fourth line now. And uh, you know, I, I didn't care. I, you know, that that I think that was always kind of a and maybe like my father with his difficult upbringing and me with my anxiety issues, maybe once you've gotten through that, you know, the rest is gravy. You know, the, that now that's hell. When you're, when you're panic stricken uh, for no apparent reason, uh, that is hell. Uh, but to not have uh, a hockey night in Canada career, that wouldn't be hell. And, uh, and to teach, uh, which would be uh, just a, and I, you know, I'm obviously you and I do that in this line of work. Uh, that's, that's kind of where I ended up in a funny way anyway. So, yeah, but I do. I do thank Bernie for two things. He he also got me into refereeing hockey, which I did for twenty three years. So, and Bernie died young. So there, you know, I always remember Leonard Cohen said that the great singer Leonard Cohen, he took flamenco guitar lessons in Montreal. Uh, that's how he wrote the song Hallelujah. His greatest hit uh, was based on this guy teaching him some six chord progression. Uh, but that guy died. Uh, I think the guy died of mental health that resulted in suicide. Uh, um, but that guy shaped Leonard Cohen and he was just like in and out of his life in a heartbeat. And Bernie was not just in and out. Bernie and I went to school. Our moms were dear friends, Kay Roth and my mom, Lila. But he, he got me into refereeing. He used to listen to the junior hockey broadcasts religiously. He used to try to imitate the play-by-play -play man of the Calgary Centennials of the Western Hockey League. Uh, and he was a great influence without us ever realizing that, you know, he was kind of shaping what I would do for the rest of my life all the time. Refing and broadcasting, I totally owe to Bernie Roth. It's, uh, I hate to get too deep, but, you know, I, I just, I, I think of that influence on your life. And I go back to when I interviewed Brian Burke and he talked about a snowstorm got him into hockey. And mm. it's just, it's funny, uh, every day will present uh, a new opportunity to mm -hmm. learn or to possibly change the way you're thinking or steer you this way, that way. And you just don't know where that leads. And I think it's pretty evident, you know, some people are Wayne Gretzky and they're skating by two years old and away they go or Connor McDavid for the newest generation. And, and, and that's spectacular in itself, but I find it mesmerizing when you hear stories like yourself where it wasn't a thought and, you know, to go to your refing career, Ron, I find it interesting that you didn't used to submit mileage and that right. you, you didn't, uh, you know, and for people who, I guess, aren't refs, and I've never refed, but I, I understand that when you travel, you submit your mileage, you get paid for it, and you carry on. So what was it about refing that you just enjoyed it? Because I, I got to be honest, refing uh, refs are probably a dying breed right now. Like, th mm -hmm. that is not right. an enjoyable um, occupation for most. And well, yet here again, you have high, high things about it. Here, here's another quirk in my life that I, I sit back and try to understand why it is this way. But, you know, when I was telling you about all the anxiety I suffered from the time I was 20 till the time I was 35. Now, Kelly Rudy may have touched on this. Anxiety is a huge issue. Mental health, you know, in his family's uh, situation, the daughters, especially one, has had tons of experience with uh, anxiety. Anyway, I had a 15 year window in life where I suffered it. Um, never on the ice. Never once, no matter how big the game that I refereed, did I feel uh, unglued or uh, scared or, you know, starting to feel that fight or flight. And I often wondered, is it because I was in motion? Was it, you know, the skating that kind of uh, gave me a little, for some reason, subliminal uh, relaxation? But I, I, did, I did find a refuge on the ice. Uh, you know, I, I found that everything that I wanted to be, the teacher that I wanted to be, that I was struggling to do well, I mean, I was... I was on Hockey Night in Canada, so I guess I wasn't struggling. But uh, deep down, I felt like it's not going quite as smoothly or as easily uh, as you would like it to. I, I'll never forget, Sean, I was in New Jersey doing a game, a Stanley Cup playoff game, and we were getting ready for the anthem, and the security guard came over to me. I don't know if I was pacing or what, but the security guard at uh, the Burn Arena in uh, the Meadowlands, New Jersey, he came over and he says, uh, you're really grinding tonight, aren't you? And he could just see my angst, you know, like I wasn't, this was not fun. You know, how, you know, people go out there, have a good time, be great, have fun. You know, never. I was like freaking wound like a clock. Um, but I, I knew that. So I would offset it with, you know, some mental self-talk. Anyway, the refereeing part uh, gave me the luxury of going out, uh, 
teaching. You know, I love to communicate with the players. Hey, too. Everybody in the building saw that was a hook. You're down to nothing. If I call that, they score on the power play. We can all go home. I need you. Your team needs you, you know, not to do that right now. Um, so I'm going to let you go this time, but you can't make me look stupid. Uh, and I, and that would work, you know, five out of six times. The sixth time the guy would say, Oh, go F yourself. Just make the effing call. I was uh, probably the sixth time. Yeah. Stop yeah. And I, I'm, I'm... <laughs> and I love that. You know, that was one thing about, you know, in our house, again, back to mom, mom did not like, um, false modesty. She didn't like pretense. She didn't like, you know, pomposity. So she got a kick out of, you know, the pistols that are the rebels in life. And, and so did I. I, I they were my meat. I, I obviously grapes was was a, a rebel who was you know I was trying to harness for thirty four years. I got away with it, and then we finally fell into a new reality and lost uh, lost it. But uh, so that was that was a big part of my upbringing was to to admire uh, the other, even if the other was uh, a little bit of a rebel. You know, um, y- you've brought up uh, depression or that or anxiety. Uh, for a good chunk of your life there. And you you mentioned going on the ice and it all going away. And there is something to be said about that because I think any hockey player, there's something about you get on the ice and all the world just fades away. That's what I, you know, most guys who, who end up retiring from hockey miss the dressing room, but there is something to be said about once you're on the ice, there's everything else just fades away. I always love Matt Sundin. He, he mentioned the camaraderie of the room, but he said his favorite thing about the game that he misses the most was that first step through the gateway, like Braden Holpe, that first step through the gateway onto the ice, packed arena, big game. Uh, and he just loved that step, you know, and I, I do remember for me, it was standing at the center ice as a referee, uh, big junior A playoff game. And, you know, the sweaty, you know, guys in front of me that have done the pregame skate and now they have all this perspiration on the back and the steam is rising and they're just full of piss and vinegar and ready to go at it. And I thought, okay, wise guy, how are you going to keep this one under control tonight? <laughs> well, and more important, how are you going to let this one fly? You know, I, I really wanted a game that was on the edge, uh, not unsafe, but on the edge where the, the players really gave fully uh, to the process. And it was a great, just a great time refereeing hockey. I, I think a lot about that. And, and I certainly I think it was a, a good lesson in how to cope with, you know, those anxieties that I've had. Um. While you're on Coach's Corner, I think you, you mentioned it. You're still refing. Are you refing full time? Not anymore. No, I stopped actually, Sean. I did it for 23 years from 1988 uh, to 2004 when they had the lockout that wiped out the entire NHL season. That screwed me up because um, as a referee, you give the calendar to your assigner and you say, okay, these are the dates I'm available in this month. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. We were, we were doing movie night in Canada, which was uh, all over the country and it was filmed on different days. And I was in and out of New York to interview Bob Gooden or Gary Bettman, or I was into Toronto or it was just a mess. Uh, there was no, it was like COVID-19 times, you know, it, there was no real dependable scheduling. Uh, so I, I gave up the refereeing that year. And when it came back, it was the beginning of the two referee system. Uh, and it was a serious crackdown that year on obstruction. Uh, there was uh, 12,000 power plays in 2003-04, the year that Tampa beat Calgary in the final. There was 18,000 power plays the, the year they came back, and Carolina won it principally on the basis of special teams. And I'm not knocking them because I love that team, and I love Brenda Moore's cup voice. Um, but I found uh, it was just a different game, and I thought two refs changes you know, how you're going to manage a game. Uh, they don't want you to manage a game anyhow. They just want you to point and say, hey, identify the penalty and go. And they've backed off that a bit, to my mind, thank heavens. Um, so I, I just stopped at that point, and I started playing. And I hadn't played in years, and now I play twice a week, and that's it. But still on the ice. And, then you know, that's sort of do the Battle of the Blades. You know, that's another version of that freedom. And back to what you were saying, the, the players, and why I think you don't suffer anxiety as much. They say that, you know, when you use your power, uh, and when you have freedom, those are the two things that will heal you. Uh, freedom from, you know, the shackles of addiction, uh, freedom from no choice. Uh, if you have a choice, if you're allowed to make your choices in life and if you're free from addictions, uh, and secondly, if you do something powerful, like, you know, drive a chuck wagon team or play the game, uh, you're going to heal. You're going to feel if, uh, you're going to feel a real sense of healthiness. Uh, which is, I think, what skating and, and refereeing gave me. 
I hear a lot of successful people talk about hard work and luck. And uh, in your career, I know I've, I think I've read it several times where you talk about, you know, you, you had some lucky breaks. And Dave Hodge's pen flip, I don't know if it gets yep. any bigger of a, a break than that. Mm -mm. But before we get to the pen flip, I'm curious because the pen flip happens. And I'm sure they had three or four or 10 guys that they had thought about putting there. What did you do? I mean, nobody can predict the pen flip. Pen flip is, that's, I don't know, pick a word. You got a word probably. That's, that's unbelievable to happen that allows you to become what you become. But previous to that, how did you separate yourself from everybody else? What did you do in order to become uh, the guy that lucky. they're like, Ron's going to be the guy? I got really lucky that I was 26 and the incumbents, the guys they were thinking of having replaced Dave were Brian Williams and Brian McFarlane. And their feeling was, and I think it was a little bit inspired by what had just happened in the United States. I might be wrong on the timing of this, but when Dan Rather tried to replace Walter Cronkite, impossible. Uh, for those who don't know, Walter Cronkite was a preeminent news anchor at CBS. Larger news than and, life. Larger than life news anchor. And the guy who came along did okay, but you know, really had no chance. And they knew that the guy replacing Dave Hodge was going to have no chance. And they didn't want to do that to uh, well-known, respected broadcasters like McFarlane and Williams. And they thought, we had this 26-year-old uh, guinea pig. You're fresh meat. Who was fresh meat. And I was, <laughs> and I was kind of dependable. Uh, it was the, the, and the only thing that saved me, Sean, I remember, because I was a deer in headlights. I was terrible for at least two years, if not more. But I had one gift that, that's uh, rare, and it came from my DJing days. I was good with time counts. So ironically, when Dave Hodge flipped the pen, he was count, counted off the air, and he had a tantrum and uh, didn't go well. Uh, you know, he was, he was right in everything that he said. And in the days now, with social media, he would have had no trouble. He, there would have been a revolt so big against the CBC for firing Dave that he would have never been fired. Uh, but back in the day where it was only male, um, the, the response came too late to save Dave and I took over this. So I, I actually start my career with a scarlet letter. Everybody hates me because I'm taking over for the good guy. And I spent most of last year with the scarlet letter because grapes got let go, you know? So I, I've lived that sort of torment, but that doesn't bother me one bit. It's like refereeing, you know, half the people like the call, half hate. So I'm, I'm okay. And I, I could live with that part of it. Uh, but anyway, I just remember, uh, you know, that was, the, that was a, a crazy moment to be in the room when Dave flipped the pen and then to uh, listen to CBC posture on how that was going to go down and, uh, and suddenly be there that, you know, I knew I was just this young guy that they were throwing, you know, to the wolves. And fortunately, somehow, I survived the, the I'd say, three-year apprenticeship and ended up staying. Did you, uh, when you got the call and you're, you're like, holy man, I'm taking over Dave Hodge. Were you like, you know, if I can figure this out, this is like the biggest opportunity of my life? No, no, I, I didn't, Sean. And, I, and I, I hate to be, that's why I hope my mom doesn't think this is false modesty, but I didn't care. Uh, I, I, that part, you know, the, the job uh, was as special at CKRD in Red Deer as it ever has been at Hockey Night in Canada. You know, I, I thoroughly enjoyed being the weatherman in Red Deer and being the DJ, uh, putting on a song at six in the morning and saying it's going to be 27 today and blue skies and here's a great tune. Uh, go get a beer. Uh, that, that to me was the bedside manner, the joy of the profession. And it was as a rewarding, you know, in Red Deer as it ever has been nationally. So didn't care one iota that, you know, I, I, I knew what I had to do. Uh, I knew that, you know, whoever has given me uh, their trust, you know, there's a great saying, uh, Sean Dursey is a hockey player for the Guelph Storm. And most people say, I want to prove them wrong. But Sean Dursey says, I want to prove the people who believe in me right. And I love that turn on that phrase. And uh, I always had that. I had my, my mother gave me that pride in performance. When somebody gives you the, you know, their trust or faith, then you better, you know, come with everything you've got. And I do that. So, but I certainly have never thought of it in terms of, uh, I don't know, fame, fortune, and all the trappings. Not a chance. Oh, like I always say, my favorite song is The Wherewithal is Tragically Hip. It's not my favorite song. My favorite song is Baker Street by Jerry Rafferty. Uh, but uh, The Wherewithal by The Hip, message-wise, is my favorite song. And the lyric goes, I always loved that guy. He's not on TV anymore. 
uh, to get out before he had the wherewithal. And that is kind of saying, you know, he didn't have to do that. He just did that. And, and that's how I feel about that for sure. You know, um, you bring up Don Cherry and, uh, I know, you know, this, I come from Western Canada and not only do I come from Western Canada, I come from small town, Western Canada. So you can assume where m most of Western small town Canada lies in their, um, loyalties. And, and what happens to Don. Uh, you guys had such a fantastic relationship, Ron. And I know um, just from being the different sides of the spectrum, what was awesome to tune into every night was the banter that went on between you two was right. fantastic. You're the guy sitting there. Was it, was it like that or was it different? Oh, oh, no, it was like that. Uh, you know, in fact, when we did Scotiabank Hockey Day in Canada in Lloydminster, uh, Grapes and I did a little skit on the bar colonists and we and the whole, you know, the history of the oil discoveries and, and just how it became the border city in 1905. And, and Don's playing his part reading, you know, Mayor Huxley's proclamation of, you know, how the two cities are going to get along and the amalgamation. And I, I've watched that from time to time and just thought that's as good as it gets you know like we have no idea why we have a dynamic we both like beer both <laughs> like hockey don likes hollywood more than hockey but anyway i could force him on a good night i could force him when we go back to the hotel room to watch hockey or the nhl network because he wanted to watch either an old classic movie or he wanted to watch fox news and see what trump was up to uh, but but on the good nights I'd, I'd be able to coerce him to watch some hockey uh, and that's what people don't know. You know, he's, he's such a born entertainer. It's what made him a great coach. It's almost like, uh, not to liken myself, but almost my attitude towards, you know, being on Hockey Night in Canada was his attitude towards the National Hockey League and the Stanley Cup. He didn't care. He didn't care one iota about that, but he did care about, you know, are you giving 100% of yourself? Uh, and furthermore, um, he didn't want 80% of this guy and 80% of that guy you know, to make the team. He wanted a hundred percent self-centered, you know, go get him. Give me everything you got. Don't let, don't let me uh, down. And I'll worry about the, how we make this a team thing. <laughs> I'll figure out the system or the ice times or whatever it takes, but you just bring everything you've got. And I love that. You know, and, and so you're right. I, I remember uh, just after Don got let go, of course, ironically remembrance day, right? 2019. And I, I was uh, out to do hometown hockey the next weekend in Dauphin, Manitoba. So that's kind of rural Western Canada. And I'm driving by the farms and the houses and I'm just thinking, you know, these folks are so upset that their Saturday night ritual and their, you know, almost 40 years in the case of Don Cherry, you know, has been just summarily dismissed. And what can I do about it? There's not a damn thing I can do about it, you know, like, uh, and, and furthermore, you know, you got to sit there and try and carry on uh, crazy situation. I mean, I was, police escorts. It was like, you know, protests, wanted posters. It was a shitty deal. But it, but it was also, you know, like uh, in the scheme of things, Sean, it was, uh, and this is my mother, you know, uh, you have to respect uh, each other. And Don knew where I lay on this subject. Uh, and I, I just wish I could have somehow convinced him or Bobby Orr or somebody could have got into his head and said, just on this one, say you're sorry. And we're good. You know, uh, but I understand. I fully understand why he was sick of the politically correct is how he felt about it. Sick of, you know, the new world order. He's 86, bless his heart. You know, he, he, why does he want to, you know, play the game? So, I mean, he danced for a lot of years. I saw Don dance when he needed to, but he wasn't going to dance this time. And I, I, it's just brutal. Uh, you know, it's, it's a crummy ending to a great i will say he and i are good and i know we're good um but it's just for the viewer uh who who was locked into that you know it's it's disappointing what can i say you know i don't think uh if everybody took a step back from the situation i always said they should have given don a farewell tour about five years ago it, mm -hmm. it was getting to the point where you know he's getting older and mm -hmm. uh He's still fantastic, but you can just, at certain points, guys start to show their age. And I thought Don in the last five years started to show a bit of his age. And I thought they should have given him, you know, for what he's done for the game of hockey and entertainment and everything else. I mean, just Canada in general putting, I mean, he was iconic. I mean, you're iconic. He's sitting right beside you. Mm -hmm. 
They should have given him oh, a no. farewell tour are, and well, traded him like a that, hero. He, but he wouldn't in, want that, Sean. He, that's and the I know. And in Dawn yeah. fashion, he goes down in a burning blaze. And is there anything more Hollywood than that ending? Yeah, I think he's quite con- so content with how it ended. Uh, you know, for for him and in and his values and uh, and just the as you say, the fireball excitement of it. He always loved the movie. Uh, oh boy, uh, White Knight or something like that, where Rod Steiger is on this. Uh, so when uh, James Cameron won the Oscar for Titanic, best director, and he ended his speech by saying, look, Ma, I'm king of the world. And everybody thought, what a conceited jerk. <laughs> but it was actually Steiger from the movie White Heat, I think it's called, uh, where he's on a big oil drum. And uh, he says from the top of the oil drum, look, Ma, I'm king of the world or on top of the world. And a guy takes a gun and shoots that oil drum and he blows up. <laughs> and that's, I think, for sure, you're right on the money. Don Don was happy with how it ended, and uh, you know he loved how Bobby Orr went out, and you never saw Bobby struggle. You know Bobby, and I and I know that you know it's a long career for grapes, but uh, Bobby, you know he won his eight Norris trophies before he was 28. Uh, uh, Lidstrom, Doug Harvey, they won seven Norris trophies. They didn't win their first until they were 31 years of age. So Don liked the Bobby version of things. Well. And- you know, coming from this side of the, the country, uh, where in the beginning, at least, you probably didn't get a whole lot of support, I would assume. Um, I think one thing people forget is you guys worked a lot of years together. And that, I'm sorry, that had to have been tough on you the way it went down um, to, to lose a, a teammate, uh, a fellow exactly. comrade, partner like that. Yeah. Just oh, ex- overnight. Precisely. It was, and I, I, you know, finally slowed down in July this month uh, and, and had a chance to, you know, once again, realize just how bad the impact is internally on a person when something like that happens, you know, and it was, uh, you're, you're, I was right back to 20 years old and hyperventilating in a stereo shop on the North Hill in Red Deer. I was like, holy cow, you know, I, and, and it's impossible, Sean, to figure out what to say to somebody because a person convinced against their will is unconvinced still. And it's such a polarizing topic, and it does kind of tend to go down the political uh, delineation as well. Conservatives and liberals, you know, it, it, most of the hate mail I get is you're just like blackface, blackface Trudeau, you know. And, uh, so it's it's there's that. Uh, it's all lumped into it, uh, but that has no bearing really if you think deeply about Don and me. We we will always, uh, you know, Grapes has written me a really nice letter in, in the time since, and we talk a lot about the beer doesn't taste quite as good, you know, without the popcorn and peanuts. And yeah, I mean, as Don said, he did what he had to do and I did what I had to do. Uh, but, but we're wrapped up in a, you know, Don always said, and I, ever, I always hated it, but Don always said, you are what you're perceived to be. And uh, you know, the perception for a lot of people was what a backstabber, what a Brutus, what a Judas, you know, and on and on and on. Uh, so social media was no joy ride for a good uh, length of time. It still isn't. Uh, but, Again, you're okay. I, I'm a referee. You're hot. Go ahead and be hot. What can I do about it? Uh, I'll just keep, you know, to my values and, you know, keep to the gig. Uh, and, and that's that's all you can do, right? You know, you just got to get up and, and carry on if you if you want to do what I do. And, and I told you earlier, I, I'm not obsessed with being the host of Hockey Night in Canada. But as I said in my, you know, address right after it happened, if I walked away, which I really wanted to do in a way, uh, that would be to downplay the importance of the message that was being sent ultimately and not to get preachy about this, but in the end, this is a a crazy time where we're trying to assess social injustice, you know, whether it's the indigenous population in Canada or black lives matter or me too, there's a crazy time of vortex of uh, cosmic or social injustice being examined. None of us has the key, but to walk away from it, you know, uh, would be irresponsible. I knew that. And, and, and that would be my mom's teaching me that, you know, uh, you just can't, you just can't step down right now because then you're sort of going along to get along and uh, you're losing face, Ron, if you do that. So I, you plug away. I'm curious, where do you, I probably never in my short life paid as much attention to politics and the social injustices, and it's never been easier to. Social mm-hmm. media, as you've alluded to, makes it extremely easy for people to connect. But at the same time, instead of connecting, I find we're more device, uh, divisive than ever. Mm-hmm. And it is unnerving. And I, I've been across this uh, 
this great country. Heck, I, I, I married a woman from the States. I've been across the States. It's great people everywhere. Anywhere you go in this world, there's great people. And yet, you're kind of made to believe you're on a team. You have to pick that team. And we're against each other. And I don't know what you run. I, it, it worries me. And I wonder where it leads because the voices that are trying to level off and just be like, you know, we can talk about some of these issues and it's okay to talk. We don't have to yell and, you know, put everybody down. That, that seems to be the political landscape right now is like pitchforks are out and we're attacking the other side with everything we got. Where do you think this is going? Oh, I think in the end, it's a really good thing. Uh, I think, you know, we, we've, the world is like, uh, it, it's at a little bit of a crossroads. You know, you've got China, you've got uh, Russia, you've got UK, uh, Brexit, you've got Germany doing there. Everybody's kind of trying to be in a global community, uh, but very self-interested. And uh, that's to your point. I think, you know, to get us all on the same team is going to be a, a time of tremendous education. Like the whole... Um, whether you whether you use the indigenous example in our country or black lives in the United States, segregation is not, you know, you hear this phrase suddenly, like how in the world do we only hear systemic racism in this year, you know, but it was always there. And and the examples of how housing projects in the United States, you could only get a grant to, to build a project if you promised not to have African Americans living in it. Uh, you couldn't put African Americans in new white developments. Uh, the, the It's, it's all pretty there. messed up. Oh, the history is is terrible, you know, and, and I mean, from slavery to segregation to Jim Crow and on and on. And we and why we are kind of, I think, and I say you and me, us whites and, you know, we, we are we are hardworking. We think ethical, you know, kind people where we're messed up is like, good God, this is going to topple everything. This is going to be class warfare. This is going to be mass anarchy. Uh, so how do we get this right? And. I think, I think it's just going to kind of settle. Uh, I think, you know, deep down, we, it's, we're all very caring. And, and that's going to come to the fore. At, at some point, somehow, you know, when, when the people take away the, the vitriol, uh, I, think, I think it's going to work out. I think it's really going to be a time we'll look back and, and just say, this was the reckoning that, uh, that we kind of, and, and it'll probably be social media that helps drive that. I think I think we'll just suddenly get to this new light uh, and it'll be a good thing I, I, because I think the other version, you know, I think the reason that I had anxiety was probably because I lived in fear. You know, I, the, the expectations were such that uh, that I was just scared not to, I was scared to fail and you don't need to be scared to fail. You know, there's, we'll pick each other up it, in North America because we are built, not wrongly, but we're built a little bit on the Ayn Rand fountainhead of individual, you know, uh, self-responsibility you don't want to you don't want anybody to adopt a victimhood stance so there is a there is a fine line but i i just think the idea of self-made individuals was uh was unfair a lot of people don't have the you know inherited money they don't have the wherewithal they didn't have the education they didn't have so many things are against them from the get-go that it's not a true meritocracy so let's fix that and uh you know i, I watch you know, Trump, Trudeau, it doesn't matter. Uh, Sheer, you know, it doesn't matter. They're, they're, they're all trying right now. So have at it, you know, and then the public will, will have the final say. Oh man. <laughs> you, you worry about that? You trust democracy at your peril? Well, no, I, I, I guess it's, it's a, there's a reason why on shows going into the political landscape is it is a dangerous one because it yeah. can it can seriously oh for sure t- you know, I, I, and you know I kind of want to pull it back to Don Cherry and Coach's Corner I I will say I hope you're right I I really hope that uh, things start to move towards better than where they've currently been and and I hope I hope you're right mm-hmm. I don't have as high a praise and. Mr. Trudeau out West here. I, I, in saying that, yeah. I try really hard. I try really, really hard to try and get both sides and read things and try and get, but man, he makes it extremely tough. And I know I got, uh, you know, coming from the oil country and everything else, there's a lot of reasons to want to take pitchforks to the <laughs> out East and burn yeah. the town down. Well, I grew up. I grew up in Red Deer, right? So Pierre Elliott Trudeau with the NEP killed us, 
you know, uh, I came from Alberta when it was uh, riding high with Peter Lougheed and uh, the 70s and our reserves and our funds and uh, and they killed it. Uh, so I've been there. And, and But the problem I think, Sean, is, is that, you know, ultimately your, your, your liberals are going to try and have this blanket, this welfare approach to life so that everybody's kind of protected. And, and, and Pierre Elliott Trudeau, and I know some of your listeners are gone, but uh, I mean, he did a lot in 72 to help save people like the guy that direct, produces rather and directs Hockey Night in Canada, Shirley Najax. Family came from Uganda because of Trudeau. Uh, unbelievable human being. Uh, Shirelli is the best producer that I've ever worked for. Uh, he's his mainly Muslim. And uh, it's just bizarre that this guy is such a great hockey guy. Um, and, and, you know, the guy that negotiated the deal that Roger signed, the $5 billion deal, is uh, Nadir Mohammed, is mainly Muslim from, I think, Tanzania. Uh, these all happened in 72, and those families were invited in. And not everybody's going to be happy about it. But look, Lloyd Minster doesn't happen without the bar colonists. And I know that's the colonialists. That's the UK version. Um, but it's a form of immigration. And, and not everything that they did, Lloyd and Barr, was you know, loved by everybody either. Uh, so that's the tolerance. That's the, uh, you know, the flip of it. And then the conservatives, of course, they, they are more tailored to uh, the self-made individual and tax cuts and uh, you know, you're on your own. Um, but everybody's selfish. Everybody, the conservative wants to be themselves and take care of and I don't want to worry about that. I just want to worry about and the liberals saying, well, geez, just in case I get caught, I need this protection. They're selfish too. Everybody's selfish. So don't be mad at either. <laughs> this is the way I look at it. <laughs> but try well, and guide. Yeah. Well, let's rewind the clock. Let's go back to the first night before you hop on with Don Cherry and Coach's Corner. What was running through your head? And were you like me and not sleep a wink before this? Uh, I don't remember that part. I do remember the first time I went on with Don was, uh, Dave Hodge was still with Hockey Night in Canada. He was hosting in Vancouver that night. So it was early October, 20, uh, 1986. Um, I just remember being rigid, Sean. I was scared in the sense of, you know, stiff and, uh, just not relaxed at all deer in headlights. And that lasted for years. So, uh, and I can remember even doing the NHL awards in 1995. So I've been around now for uh, a decade and uh, you know, the drum roll and here's your host, Ron McLean. And I just had another panic attack as I hit the stage and I quickly cracked a joke that I thought would buy me some time to get my breathing under control. And, uh, and I got it, I got it under control, but um, yeah, I mean, again, I, I didn't overplay the uh, responsibility or the opportunity. Uh, I just wanted to do well for the fact that Don Wallace had hired me and uh, I owed him a good performance. Uh, I wanted to be a good teammate. I'm raised in sports. So I, I, I wasn't out for Dave Hodge's job or out to prove anything to anybody in particular. I just wanted to pull my weight. So what was the anxiety about? And maybe you've already said it once or twice, but I'm just listening to that again. And yeah. it's not about the opportunity or mm -mm. anything like that. So what were you having anxiety about going on an award show about? It, well, uh, in the case of the award show, it's just that I'm going to do the monologue. I used to get it doing the weather in Red Deer. Uh, and it was this feeling of being kind of naked and it's all on you for the next seven minutes. So in Red Deer, when I would do the weather, it was budgeted for three and a half minutes, but we'd often have the clips didn't run successfully on the newscast. We had a lot of lousy equipment. So they would say, hey, Ronnie, you got to pick up uh, the extra three and a half minutes that we're short here. So I'd have seven minutes bang, I'm on camera. And I really hadn't prepared seven minutes. I'd prepared three and a half minutes of what I was going to say. And that feeling left me unglued. Uh, and I would get the anxiety attack. In the case of the NHL awards, it's like bang on stage and you've got to do an opening monologue and you've got a lot of business to take care of. And it's about, I don't know, four to five minutes that you're there and no one else is there. You know, you have no colleague to play off of. Uh, it's just you and you got to, and I don't use a teleprompter, never have. So I got to remember everything that I'm doing and I want to deliver it well. Uh, and I get scared. <laughs> I just get scared. Uh, you know, it's like when I referee, maybe that's the secret to refereeing is the puck drops and all hell breaks loose and you don't have time to think, but I sure had time to think as I walked onto that stage. And uh, yeah. And, and I remember uh, depends on the year, but you know, sometimes I would have had a, uh, in my opinion, a rough last broadcast, you know, maybe grapes had beat me up or something. And I, wasn't feeling, you know, 100% strong in my own skin. It's crazy. You know, it, it, it really is a, a vulnerable life uh, when you're in the, you know, crosshairs of 
millions of eyes. And you know better than to think that way. I mean, you know that what they think shouldn't matter, but you're only human. You know, in reading your book, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall for you and Grape sitting having a garbage can full of beer after broadcast. What was, what was that experience like throughout your career? Was that just some of the coolest moments of your life or was it? For sure. For sure it is uh, among the coolest moments uh, of life, you know, and I, I mean, I'm a beer league hockey player. So we go to the fire hall after the games on Wednesday nights, we go to the thirsty penguin after the games on Tuesday nights. I love to drink beer and talk, you know, uh, Kurt Bensmiller and I had a fantastic night after Rogers hometown hockey was in Lloyd Minster, him and his buddies, we just sit around, drink beer and get crazy. Uh, grapes doesn't grapes is a poor drinker. He, he, he starts fast, but he, he starts to seize at about four Bud Lights. Uh, so I have to finish the, you know, extras, uh, <laughs> but we, we would sit and talk and, and sometimes it would get really, really, you know, and he hated the left wing pinko communists, you know, that the anti-Trudeau sentiment was well represented with grapes and, uh, he just could not stand left wing policy. And, uh, and then I would counter, of course, with my left wing pinko communist. And in my house, again, you think, well, how does a kid from Red Deer turn so bad? You know, how does he like Trudeau or give him any time? Uh, my mom loved Trudeau. My father did not love Trudeau. My father was a conservative all the way. Bob Stanfield from Nova Scotia was his guy back in the day. Uh, but I, you know, I loved the yin and the yang of us. Um, and I, I, I learned eventually not to take the bait. You know, I used to get kind of crushed when Don was cruel to me, not, not on air. Of course, he did it on air, but he'd also do it in the hotel room where he would just lose himself and uh, start yelling at me. And uh, but eventually I, I got to roll with it and got to laugh at it and got to enjoy it. And we, we really did have a good uh, thing going. We, you know, I, I his his all Don loved to do was sit and watch not so much the shows, but the commercials and say, why would they do that? It makes their car look like a crap. You know, and, and he had an observation about, you know, the, the political correctness of the representation in the ad or the this and the that. And he, he was just a, a joy to, you know, sit and drink with because it was like I needed to drink after listening to some of it. But he, he was, he was a, you know, we had fun. We, we just, we truly did. And we plotted our, uh, I don't even know if we plotted our course per se, we, but we did. We would talk about the next coach's corner and what we were doing. We talked shop. We would talk... Uh, the old days, you know, him coaching and me, the old days, me refereeing. And it was great times. I remember uh, reading, I wouldn't cold cock Don. I always warned him about what I was thinking. Whereas. But he'd, pl- but he'd play it, he'd play it as, you know, kind of off the cuff to help save yourselves. Is there yeah. moments that stick out where you had a grand plan? I got this great topic. And one or two things, it, it catches you hell because it's probably less hockey, more political yep. world event. Or where, or was there just moments where you're just like, holy crap, how do I pull this back? Well, there's so many, Sean. I mean, the war in Iraq uh, is one famous situation where we debated. Kretchan was the prime minister at the time and chose not to support the Americans in going into the war in uh, Iraq. Uh, that was a, you know, I had people, producers, like not just producers in the mobile, but producers at CBC on the phone in my ear telling me to cease and desist, stop talking about this. And I'd opened the can of worms and I couldn't get off of it. Uh, I took a real risk, could have been fired that night and probably should have been. Uh, um, Another one that's, uh, you know, we had Perry Belgard on, the chief of the Assembly of First Nations joined us in Regina this year for the Outdoor Classic. And that's all me, you know, poor Don. (laughs) <laughs> what are you doing to me? I don't know. I, I got some good stuff about Bobby Orr. Never mind, Don. It's just a good time to do Chief Perry. You know, you'll, you'll enjoy it. And we did. Um, but I remember uh, Phil LaFontaine was uh, high up in the uh, First Nations. And, and there was uh, Chris Simon. Chris Simon had been suspended twice, 55 games over two suspensions. He got 30 for a cross check on Ryan Holwake, came back a game. And then the next game, he stomped on Yarko Rutu of the Pittsburgh Penguins and got a 25 game suspension. And I said to Don, I said, you know, Chris is First Nations Ojibwe. Uh, a lot of young uh, First Nations kids in Canada grow up feeling they're not going to get a fair shake and they don't trust the judiciary. Uh, and maybe that explains why he, you know, he would come right back after a 30-game suspension and get another lengthy suspension. And Don launched into a, what are you calling him, a, you know, inferior complex because he's an Indian or whatever. And it was terrible. You know, it was just like a complete politically incorrect, brutal moment that I had created. Uh, and maybe in that case, I had sprung that on Don. 
And that's an example of why I did not, as a rule, spring anything on Don. But he would spring things for sure on me. If he knew, if he, knew he wanted to do something uh, politically incorrect, he'd keep it from me. That's what you're talking about, to protect me, because he knew he might go down. Uh, and that's what happened even on the last one. You know, he knew what he was doing, and, uh, uh, but it just went wrong. And then, and then for whatever reason, as I say, he, you know, he, he couldn't abide saying sorry. You know, I can't speak for everybody. Certainly cannot speak for everybody. Mm. One of the cool things about you two was you represented the opposite sides. Mm -hmm. And Skip Craig uh, from Lloyd here, former NHLer, long time ago NHLer, he told me, oh, I had him on way back in the beginning, and he always told me hockey mirrors society. Yeah. And you two being the opposites mirrored society for a long time. And the way it ended, I just can't get out of my head mm -hmm. that uh, it's too bad that's the way it went because I feel like it, it fueled the fire of what's going on less so than dampening it a little bit. Oh, I, I agree, Sean. I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. And I, I mean, it was, it's, it's in the uh, swirl of, uh, so, you know, I mean, the next day I'm at Rogers Hometown Hockey in Welland, Ontario, the Sunday, the 10th of November, and I'm having to apologize and I have to apologize. You know, we, we are under a tremendous, uh, not from the hockey fraternity. So that's the crazy part about this, right? The hockey could have easily closed ranks and nobody would have been the wiser. But this became a national story outside of our domain. And it was certainly social media driven domain. Uh, and that's a huge deal for Rogers. You know, that, that, that's, a, that's a telecommunications company that's suddenly got half of the nation upset with it. Uh, so I had to apologize. And it was clumsy as clumsy gets because I, I was busy with a panel of five NHL guys, Paul Bissonnette. I was at his home all day. I was shooting all these other things. And so it was lousy, uh, just a lousy deal. Well, and, you, and you, you beat yourself up, Ron, because that's what, uh, I mean, all the pressure on you. People, most people will never even come uh, close to a glimpse of experiencing that sort of pressure, having that many eyes on you. I can't mm -hmm. even imagine. I can't even imagine just being like, holy crap, right? Like Don, Don Cherry says, if you go back through Don and his work, part of the reason people love him mm -hmm. is because he says things that are inappropriate at times. Whether if you go right. back like 20 years and he's talking about women gabbing in the stands, right? That's, that's right. That's Don. And that's what 90, well, not 90, and, and, that's, and, what, that's what made the shock value of what you guys did good because you want people talking about it. It's buzz. Uh, and I, I admit that, that the minute you shut down dissent, you know, or shut down the other, you, you, you rather know what the enemy's thinking. Let's call him, him the enemy for just a moment. Uh, I think it just became, uh, Sean, uh, again, a, 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 you know, as a corporation, first of all, Rogers, this is a corporate, you know, it used to be CBC would get mad at Don and the, and the board of directors who owed a lot to the province of Quebec, uh, you know, and, and would be just like outraged at his things that he would say, but it was government. So they were less apt to act money. Now you're talking, you know, it's like yeah. the Edmonton Eskimos changed their name when corporations finally got involved and said, Hey, wait, in good or, or the Redskins that, that yes. that's corporations as well. Exactly. And, and that's, you know, that was the difference this time. You know, we were suddenly not owned by the CBC. We were suddenly uh, owned by somebody who has to have a corporate position or value statement of what they stand for. And Sean, whether we like it or not, um, because of uh, Idle No More and Me Too and Black Lives Matter and, and all, all these different uh, moments in time that are happening simultaneously that are changing uh, the way North America, op the world operates. Uh, you know, this is a, this is a, a collective idea that how we did things wasn't quite perfect. <laughs> and, and you only need, like I do, go to First Nations reserves uh, and do the Rogers Hometown telecast to see how unjust, you know, yeah. the situation is. And, and I know there's a ton of, you know, ways you could say, well, oh my God, that person's irresponsible and they've given up and they're a bane of society. But we made it that way. And we, we have to face that at some point, somehow, some way, I think we have to face it. And it's just so tricky. I, I, I feel, uh, I, I agree 100% that, you know, for Don to have to go down um, on that one was really hard to watch and to be a part of. Um, but in the end, uh, on principle, and that's why, you know, and that's, imagine Grapes hearing that from a friend. And, and, and nobody wants to hear someone say principle is more important than friendship. Nobody likes that. We all love loyalty. We all think love's love. Uh, but 
if you really love someone, then you would go with principle uh, in, for their sake and for the sake of others. You know, that, that's when, that's the true test is uh, will, you, will you just pander to uh, your friend and tell them mm-hmm. what they like to hear or will you love your friend and tell them what they need to hear? Uh, you, you know, if you're raising your kids, at some point you're going to tell them when, when somebody says, hey, try this crack cocaine, <laughs> you hope they have the courage not to choose friendship over what's right. Well, I said at the beginning, I'd warn us at 55 minutes. Well, we've, we've hit 55 minutes. And all I can think of is I got uh, the producer in my ear going, Sean, get off the topic. You have so many things you want to talk about. So I find it, the reason I, I obviously talk about it so much is it's obviously on my mind. And not sure. so much you and uh, Don. I, 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 um, I think that it, it's just, that's where we are. Uh, that, that is where we are. And you both have handled it in the ways you thought was best. And honestly, from viewers, that's all anyone ever expected out of you two at all times. Mm-hmm. At all times. That's the way you've been for 37 years of working together is you both are on the opposite sides and it's been so fun to watch. Now, at 55 minutes, do I have you for a few more? I, 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 I've been grilling you for a bit. Well, let me tell you one, one story and then you can think of a question. But uh, for the 100th anniversary of your show, I remember being in Lloyd for the 100th anniversary of uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta. So 2005, the Western Hockey League, I don't know if you were there, the, the Western Hockey League had an all-star game. Were you there? Yeah, I believe so, yeah. So we're in the arena and the power goes out. We have a massive heavy snowstorm. And uh, we, I remember leaving the rink and it was like a procession, like a uh, field of dreams, cars all going to get beer. That was the focus was to go get beer and then back to the hotel and we drank beer. And uh, I remember Dean and Deb MacArthur were at the game. And uh, anyway, it was a great, great, I don't know if the Reddens were there uh, or the Hartnells, uh, but anyway, it was a great, great night. Uh, and it all was around uh, drinking beer. So when you get uh, this, this conversation you and I have been having, is very much a campfire chat. You know, it's, it's what you do with uh, minus the beer. And it's, it's important. Would have been better with beer, Ron. Would, well, I don't know. <laughs> you might have, you, the Trudeau thing might have really sent you. <laughs> no, I, no, no. I, 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 uh, I'm just kidding. No, I know. I, I, I pride, I really try to pride myself in, in, well, it's one of your lessons, right? Trying to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and, and trying That's to it. calm that. Mm-hmm. I'm an emotional guy. I, I, I really resonate with, with uh, the Don Cherry. You're at a bar. I get in a fight. Whether I'm right or wrong, Ron, we're friends. Yeah. Are you fighting? I think yeah. anyone and their dog can get behind that. That makes complete sense to anyone. And we've all been pulled into a fight we don't want to be in. Yeah. It works for the bar. It does work yeah. for the bar. Because if yeah. you see your buddy getting in a tussle, yeah. the brotherhood says, we're getting in a tussle. And, and you're going to have a beer and you're going to ice your fist or your eye or whatever afterwards and you're going to figure it out. On a larger scale, it becomes way more complicated than that. Mm-hmm. Like way more. But I don't yeah. know. I, I, that, I, I, I did exactly not, right, I, I got to be honest, I didn't plan this coming on and I find myself yeah. Yeah. going, okay. I got it in my ear and I, I, I can hear the producer going, you know, it's time to move on. It's time to move on. And I'll, and I read it in, you know, about you when you get stuck on, uh, you know, you go back to when you had done your research. I, I listened to you on uh, 630 Chad. This was right before I started this probably three years ago, Ron, um, instead of Bob Stoffer being on, uh, it was one of the interns or one of the producers was on covering for Bob Stoffer. And he had asked a question of you, what do you, what makes you like, I listened to you just rattle off facts and whatever. And you'd had a lesson early on in your career. Uh, this is what you were telling them that for every hour you're on with a guest, you need to do 10 hours of research and preparation. Mm-hmm. And I did, I, I, I've done so much prep work on you. And at the end of the day, I didn't think I was walking in to talk about politics. I really didn't. And yet here we are. And we've talked probably 40 minutes on politics. And I, I know that my uh, viewing audience is Don Cherry. That they're, yeah. they're going to, they're going to harass me that I didn't grill you more, except that I, 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 you, sir, are the reason why I do so much preparation. You're also the, one of the reasons why I try at all times to 
push myself to be in the other person's position and try and figure that out because I think that is a really um, difficult thing to do at all times when you want to go screaming mad and just let emotion take over. It's you got to have the ability to just take a step back and kind of see things for what's happening and understand both sides because there's always two sides to a coin, always. Right. Yeah, I, I think that's it in a nutshell. And you know, uh, <clears throat> it's it's there's a, it's a time of uh, great listening. You know, the, uh, none of us. It's hard not to sit in judgment, right? That's the 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 world is hardwired now to likes and dislikes, and uh, that's a social media phenomena. But it's also you know it's, it's always been there, and that's why you're right. It was nice in the case of the coach's corner to have sort of polar opposites. Try and, uh, and 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 ironically, you know, if Don goes down uh, over. Uh, um, saying something bad about those who are marginalized. He was always the voice of the marginalized. <laughs> he was the anti-establishment. He was the one with whom they connected or could identify. So there's, there are tremendous, uh, you know, confusions about the, that whole situation. But uh, and, and I, I think as a broadcaster, you know, as a, you know, especially now, um, you know, I, I watch it like you do. I watch it all and I, I think, God, this is so immense, so serious. Uh, could I ever, you know, come up with the words or come up with something that will bridge? Uh, it seems impossible. Uh, but it's the challenge. It's, it's, the, uh, it's the challenge before us right now. And uh, yeah, you don't want, and, and that's, you know, I, even going into this hockey, we haven't even talked hockey, it's funny. <laughs> um, we're going into this crazy <laughs> hockey Stanley Cup tournament, right? Where we have the qualifying round and then we have four rounds of playoffs, knock on wood that, you know, we get through this with all the COVID. Um, but I think to myself, okay, we're just going to take summer and throw it off to a total escape of getting to watch McDavid and Dreisaitl do their thing. And that's a good thing. But I also feel a little bit of an abdication of uh, the heavy conversation that had been going on for a couple of months here. And, Oh gosh, it's complicated. You know, nobody wants it rammed down their throat. Though back to that, a man against, you know, convinced against his will is unconvinced still. There's nothing I can say to change your, you know, your way. Uh, but I, I will go to my grave, kind of trying to facilitate pulling out the different versions. And uh, and in the case of, you know, when you when you uh, cross the line, like a, as an example with grapes and me, <laughs> and then we'll leave it alone. But maybe uh, <laughs> when you have two guys in a foxhole. And the commanding officer comes along and says, okay, we're taking that hill. And the one guy says, no, I'm not going. Well, now what do you do? You know, uh, do you stay with your friend or do you do what the commanding officer wanted? And, and it's tricky. You know, a, a military, uh, it's, it's like the poor police under uh, incredible, you know, pressure right now. And you know how we all love and admire police officers. When we see mistakes made, those are mistakes made. That isn't an, uh, to you know, condemn the entire force, but they feel it, you know, they, they feel, you know, it, 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 most of the great things, like I always say with hockey, when I, when you say change the hockey culture, yes, certain things need to change, but God, the humble Broncos don't need to change. You know, uh, you would want, uh, Brad Richards was sent off to play at Athel Murray school in Wilcox. Uh, you would want to put your child in the care of, uh, Barry McKenzie or Terry O'Malley. Lots of great things in hockey. Well, and and so, you know, it's, we shouldn't get ourselves too wound or too out of joint about it. We should try, like you just said, try to be balanced. Uh, but that isn't easy. It definitely is not easy. You know, was there ever a time, Ron, where you had done your research and were convinced of a point mm -hmm. and had your mind changed? Um, I'll give you the, the, my, my, my core belief was that men and women are the same and that we are all, uh, the same. Uh, and I think through the last, uh, 10 years, my, you know, cause I was an only child, child again, without, uh, context. Uh, but I firmly believe that the human condition had to be the same for everyone. But I think what I've realized, uh, in the last few months is the experience of living, a an indigenous life or a black life, or a female life, or a transgender life, you know, not to scare your audience again. Uh, you know, th these are all uniquely shaping uh, these people's lives. And uh, I was a bit, you know, growing up in Red Deer, Alberta, privileged as we like to call it. And you know, if I use the term white male privilege, 
just infuriates people, right? Uh, but that's what I had. I had I had privilege. I had to worry about my hockey card collection and hopefully marrying a pretty girl, and that's what I had to worry you about. You realize ears are absolutely on fire right now. I probably yeah. just got turned off. That's all right. Oh, I, I know. <laughs> you can't say it, right? But it's, no, it's you, can, you, can, you can say it. Yeah. Yeah, you have to. You, have, you, you can't it's, be afraid of that stuff. You know, like, uh, oh, hey, listen, uh, I go to the rodeo every year. You think it's easy to deal with animal activists? No, no. I was I was going to say this. Uh, yeah. You can say it. The yeah. thing that rural communities have an issue with, and there is a bone of contention there, Ron, mm -hmm. is you. Uh, you know, I get to I go. I, I I'm we're working for the Lloyd Archives now for the last little bit, and I've got to go around and interview, um, roughly let's call it seventy to ninety year olds, about their stories and their journeys and the lives they've lived and the hardships they've had to endure, mm -hmm. and what. White privilege, that word in itself, doesn't take into account, in my opinion, is that those stories of uh, life on the prairies was not, was, not, was not easy. And I don't think most, well, there's the stories of people just packing up and going home because this life sucks. All, all the and, privilege means, uh, Sean, is that as an example, uh, when the treaties were signed on uh, you know, the Assiniboine and Red River in Manitoba and the land was supposed to be the First Nations, it was taken. It was just taken and arbitrarily taken by the colonists and farmed and they made money and uh, the First Nations were moved to Peguis and then beyond. Uh, and then they were put in residential schools. That's what privilege is. It's, it's that you didn't have that. You didn't have your culture stripped from you. Like maybe, um, yeah. you know, so that's all it is. It's not, it's not saying that life is easy or that, that you have, but, but you just aren't put in a position where it's so hard to succeed. Uh, which is what happened to the indigenous, which is what happened to the blacks in America. That's all. Uh, no, and, anyway. and I should say, uh, my wife is from Minnesota, and she tells me all the time that uh, we get so defensive about it because it's an attack on us when it's just... Yes. Uh, That's right. She's right. You and, know, you know, as an example, the Calgary Stampede starts with Guy Wiedek. He gets all the credit, but it was his wife, uh, Grace Bensall, who uh, was raised uh, on a Sioux reserve in Minnedosa, Minnesota. Uh, she learned a trick ride with the First Nations down there. They called them the Native Americans. Uh, she was the driving force. She was the star performer. He was okay, but she was incredible. Um, and uh, Florence Ledoux is what her rodeo uh, pseudonym was. Um, amazing story, right? And, yeah. uh, and But they, they just, you know, and I mean, when you, when you hear... Well, they'd like to take the four presidents off Mount Rushmore. Of course, it makes you think, what the hell? You know, like, uh, it just doesn't sound right. But, but it's all part of it. It's, it's, a, it's a very fascinating uh, time, you know. And, uh, oh, my God, Wendell Clark, when we were doing uh, Scotiabank Hockey Day, where the hell were we this year? Yellowknife. So uh, he comes into the dressing room and he starts to talk about the modern way of coaching. And he's mocking, you know the miscongeniality that's now coaching the national hockey league guys. And it's, Oh, it's, we're all twisted right now, but, but it's important. Uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's been a, it, and we are defensive. We, we, we are worried that, you know, everything that we have that we worked so hard for is somehow going to be diminished or altered or taken. Um, and it's not, it's it, what, you know, it's like women's rights. It's, they're not saying replace us men, they're saying, let us work alongside and, you know, maybe give you a point of view that, you know, like back to my mom. I mean, if I don't have my mom's point of view on life, I'm lost. Uh, not everybody gets to have a mom and a dad. That's privilege. You know, the, 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 that's all it is. It's just examples of, uh, of, of something that others are never going to or have had uh, and, and being aware so that you're not blind all the time to, to their sensibility. Which this is going to lead me to. I've wondered this about you for a long time because you are absolutely excellent at speaking and talking and talking about different issues. How do you prepare for something that's not in your wheelhouse? You, you did hockey for so well, mm -hmm. continue to do, I shouldn't say did you continue to do it. And it, it's been a mainstay. And, you know, you joked earlier that, you know, we've been talking, we haven't even talked about the playoffs coming up, which is kind of hilarious. Yes. But how do you prepare, sir, for, things that aren't in your wheelhouse. And I just mean wheelhouse as, you know, your mainstay job is hockey and going to hockey communities and talking to hockey people and having their stories shared, but through kind of the context of hockey. 
well, for me, it's reading. Obviously, Sean, you can see the bookshelf in behind me. Like all those books uh, up there, that's all First Nations research. You know, there's a book called A Fair Country by John Ralston Saul, another one called The Comeback, fantastic. Tanya Talega, uh, Seven Feathers Fallen, uh, Tanya Tagak, Split Tooth, and on and on and on. Those are books about the Indigenous situation in Canada. Over, uh, way over here, on the other side of the bathroom door, those are all books on ethics. That, that shelf up over there, above the TV, those are all, uh, that could be uh, Aristotle, that could be, you know, uh, <laughs> Margaret Somerville's an ethicist who taught at McGill. Um, so, and I always, I'll tell you a story how I got onto this was with grapes. Back in the 80s, I was speaking at the Ontario High School Hockey Championships in Dryden, Ontario, just outside Thunder Bay. That's where I played my junior. So, you know, yeah. And, and uh, I'm in Dryden and a kid comes up to me, he says, hey, Mr. McLean, would you sign an autograph for my brother, Jeremy? And I was with the guidance counselor at the local high school. And he says, hey, Todd, don't you want an autograph from Mr. McLean? And Todd says, oh, no, I'm a grapes guy. Grapes is right. Get rid of the foreigners. <laughs> now, this is like 1988. And uh, I thought, holy cow, I got to have to read a little bit about ethics and how I'm going to sort of assuage the message that we're giving. And that's, that, that is how it happens, you know, like, uh, so I, I read. I just, you know, and it doesn't, and that's, again, back to, you can read till the cows come home. Doesn't give you the wisdom. Uh, that living the life, you know, of uh, on the reserve or in the ghetto, uh, you know, it just doesn't represent, I, I have not worn makeup and a dress. It doesn't give me the right to think that men and women come from the same. We, we, I'm sure at core, we have certain things that are identical, but um, I, I have definitely had my little world of convenience shattered. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, I got to sit down with Theo Fleury, uh, about a week ago and talked to him a little bit about what he, he'd gone through. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I know what you mean when you say I, I didn't wear, I haven't wore the dress or what have you. I certainly have not been in the position of Theo. So when he talks, it's hard to offer up suggestions because his experience is just so, well, everybody knows, most people I would assume know Theo's uh, story and it's awful. It is absolutely awful. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how I'd ever deal with what he's gone through. And to hear his perspective is very interesting. And what you're suggesting, once again, with um, your book collection and everything, is you can learn about it. But yeah, it's you, different to l l read and learn, but uh, it's something so to go through it and live it. Here's another example. Uh, Shad, the hip-hop artist. So I, I I know nothing about hip hop music. Uh, I mean, it has been at the top of the rock charts. It is the top of Billboard's Hot 100 for 20 years now, hip hop music. Drake, of course, of Canada is the number one in the world. Um, it's almost like growing up in the 60s and not knowing there was a British invasion, missing the Beatles and the Stones and David Bowie and the rest of it. Uh, <laughs> that's how bad it is for me not to know a thing about hip hop. I remember saying to Kurt Bensmiller, I said, you guys, he said, you know the Red Hot Chili Peppers? He said, yeah, Ron, we get radio in Dewberry. He was, <laughs> he was mad at me. But I don't know hip hop much. Um, Shad, uh, the hip hop artist from Toronto, said there's a thing called false equivalencies. And that is the difference between what you read or you learn in school and what you experience. And it was a great lesson. You know, again, it's just to hear these, you know, normally I, I feel like Sean, I'm 60 years old. I've been paid. To, I don't take much money for even speaking. It's rare I take a fee for that either. But um, I, I used to get paid to go speak. Now I feel like it's going to be time to get paid to go listen. You know, just go around the country, keep listening. And I have, you know, I, I, I was out at uh, Salmon Arm. That was, was the last show we did on Hometown Hockey before the COVID-19 outbreak. And uh, we were telling the story of Tara Sloan, my colleague, the co-host of the show, uh, the story of her grandmother and how her grandmother was not allowed to go to McGill, even though she qualified, she was Jewish. And they never, they had a quotient on the number of Jews. So there again, privilege. Lots of people go to McGill, but not Jews. Um, and so she qualified. She was given a rare exemption to go and her father said, no, no. Better that you be a nurse or a teacher. A judge or a lawyer is not really a woman's work. So she wasn't allowed to go by her father. Tara told that story. And then the mayor in Salmon Arm said, well, then you should know about Mary Thomas. Mary Thomas is known as the mother of truth and reconciliation. So uh, that feather, uh, the leather feather. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You see I it see over it. there? Yeah. Uh, behind the two beaded uh, pendants. Um, that's, that's from Salmon Arm's First Nations Reserve. And Mary Thomas raised 13 kids, 
fought for uh, legal rights for the indigenous in her Shushuap Lake district. Uh, that's the Shushuap uh, Reserve, Reser or First Nation. Um, unbelievable story. And the mayor was dialed into it in, in a way that was, and he's a longtime educator, uh, teacher. Uh, it was great. And, and that's, so I'm going to keep going around the country and I know, and, and I, I believe me, I will keep grapes alive in, in the conversation and in my heart. And I won't let uh, someone who, you know, is not interested in the PC movement uh, just be excluded. Uh, that, that won't happen. I'm, I'm a referee. I want you to drop the gloves when you need to. Uh, but <laughs> well, it's, it's uh, good. It's good to have discussion. Yeah. It's, it's, you yes, got to keep totally. No, no different than a marriage or, or in right. politics, anything. When you stop talking, that's when the real problems arise. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You know, over your career, you've got to be around some absolute legends. I mean, you just name them and you've interviewed them, talked to them, that kind of thing. Did you ever have a moment where you got to be a fly on the wall or sit down and have a beer and you're looking around the room going like, how am I sitting here? And, and, mm -hmm. Maybe oh, the many. stories that were shared? Many. Uh, you know, I, I didn't really think about it at the time, but I interviewed Muhammad Ali when I was 24. Uh, that's fair you to You got to sit down with Muhammad Ali. Interviewed him in Calgary. He was there to visit. A, he was a, on a corporate gig, a furrier, a man who sold fur coats, brought Muhammad Ali in. And only two guys got to interview him, myself for television and a guy named Don Sands, a radio announcer. Um, anyway, I, yeah, imagine 24 years old interviewing Muhammad Ali and, you know, Gretzky's the same. The what the heck one. did you, what did you ask? Uh, I don't remember. I was 24. I, I just uh, remember, uh, it was around the time of the Olympics. So I asked him about Sean O'Sullivan and, uh, Willie DeWitt. Uh, and I talked a little bit about his, you know, Howard Cosell. That was fascinating to me, his famous interviews with Howard Cosell. But yeah, I, I hardly remember it. It's, uh, 35 years ago plus. Um, and, and my, for me, the, uh, there's been so many times, like I, I emceed the closing of Maple Leaf Gardens. I emceed uh, Canada Day on Parliament Hill the last time that Her Majesty the Queen was there. Uh, it was funny. Christopher Plummer, you know who he is? He's an actor, uh, did The Sound of Music. He's 80 plus now, so not everybody knows Christopher Plummer, but still was doing Shakespeare down in Stratford, Ontario. Her Majesty loved Plummer, the actor for his role in The Sound of Music. So she wanted him to introduce her at Canada Day Ceremony on Parliament Hill. I'm the master of ceremonies. I'll introduce Christopher and he'll introduce Her Majesty. So he writes up a little intro for the Queen and it has to go through Scotland Yard and the RCMP and Parliament Hill and uh, Buckingham Palace. And they come back to Christopher and said, it's a little too highbrow. We need to uh, simplify this, Christopher. He says, well, you can go F yourself. I'm not coming. <laughs> so we don't think he's coming to introduce the queen. Then the word comes on June 30th, that evening, he's going to actually drive from Stratford or be driven from Stratford after his performance in the Shakespeare Festival to Ottawa. And he is going to introduce the queen and he has simplified the message somewhat. So he arrives on a blistering hot morning. He's straight through the night. They drive it's eight hours up to Ottawa. He arrives and there's a dressing room for him and me. I'm with Christopher Plummer. I don't know how many Academy Awards and everything else. So we, he and I are sharing a dressing room and he arrives and they're on a meal break. So there's nobody to show him where to go on the stage or where his microphone will be or how to get onto the stage. So I do that. I, I take over as his wrangler and I, I show him where he's going to enter the stage and where he's going to do the address to introduce the queen. And this is Christopher Plummer. For me, Sean, that is a weird deal. That, that is, I don't know who your hero is, but he's not my hero, but he kind of is. And, uh, and then I take him back to our little ATCO trailer dressing room set up on Parliament Hill. And I put him in there and I think, God, the man needs a moment to himself. He's been driving through the night. He did Shakespeare last night. He's going to introduce Her Majesty. So I leave him and I go out and sit in the grass. Now I got an MC about a three hour show and it's 30 degrees already at 10 in the morning, blistering hot sun pouring down on my bald head. I'm just getting <laughs> soaked, you know, like having to give him some space. And we do the show and the 80 year old Christopher Plummer goes out there and he just Honest to God, it was spellbinding how great he was. He introduced Her Majesty like actors do, where every word is eight syllables. I introduced The Last of the Hip. That was another freaking uh, yeah. mind-blowing moment when I was in Rio de Janeiro and they're up in Kingston to do the last show. So lots of, you know, how does a kid from Red Deer end up in those gigs? But that's just, it comes with the territory. Well, I think it's a tip of the cap of how talented you are at what you do it, it's or, or lucky or just you know it's like 
They, yeah. I'm, no, I'm known commodity, right? So I always say that. Here's I would win TV awards, I think, for that. It was horrendous, you know, but you're on Hockey You, you call it luck, Ron. I'll give, you, I'll give you luck once or twice. I'll, I'll give you the break with uh, Dave Hodges. Call yeah. it luck. Call it, you know, divine fate of it was coming anyways. But after that, I mean, you watch what you do and, you know, just the, the, the bookshelf of how many books you – there's a reason why uh, – Mm-hmm. Your ability to sit across from anyone or to go to a new place. Like how many new places do you go to in a new year, in, in a year? Yeah. Well. And how many guests? And every time it's like, it's downright impressive when you're talking to somebody and you're like, holy man, that's kind of cool. Like that you can just, you have that in mind. I think Kelly Rudy equated you to, to Wayne Gretzky as uh, being in the same conversation. Obviously, Wayne's the hockey player, but just the way your minds work. Yeah. And he, he as a viewer, you can see it. He remembers 802 goals. Well, he ended up with 894, but he remembers them all, right? And uh, he is a – and I have a good short-term memory. I don't think I have Wayne's memory, per se, Sean. But, you know, Gretzky is a, he's a special one to, to observe. Uh, for sure. And, uh, and, and in my case, you know, I can pick up something and I've got it. So that's, you know, when you're interviewing a myriad of guests, it's nice to have a good short-term memory. Ask me five years from now, who knows? Well, let, let me take you back to 1994 then. The 99 All-Stars. This is so foreign to my brain because I would have been eight years old at the time. I wouldn't have really been paying attention to much. The hockey season wasn't been playing anyways. But you get to go mm-hmm. with – just a crazy group of talented athletes overseas away from everything. What, what was that experience like? And is there any stories you can share from? It? Oh gosh. Yeah. So many. I mean, Wayne stole my passport. How's that? Uh, you know, <laughs> I was, I was partying, I was drinking a double uh, salt Sambuca with uh, beer. And I don't know if Wayne thought I was partying too much, but he stole my passport to make morning hard you know like I would have a tough time unbeknownst to Wayne I woke like after I went to bed I woke an hour later couldn't find my passport I panicked I got on a train to I I went down to the lobby and one of the Finnish journalists we were in Finland said well Ron you know tomorrow uh, is the last day before Independence Day here in uh, (laughs) Finland is December 5th or 6th so you better get to the passport office so I just jumped on a train down to Helsinki I was in Tempere Uh, that's one story and my favorite though is we, we move on into Sweden and we're, uh, well, actually, take that back. We're in Oslo first. We play a game in Oslo, Norway. And the king, Johan Olaf Koss, is a speed skater. He and the king host us for a big soiree afterwards. And that night gets carried away. And I remember Rob Blake, Brett Hull, and myself, and one of Wayne's, uh, Janet's brother. Uh, we go to a house party like an hour north of Oslo, well into the night. Scramble back again to make the bloody bus or the flight. Uh, we go over to Gothenburg, Sweden. After the game, uh, we go to the bar at the SAS Hotel, and I go to the bar and get a rum and coke for Bob Cole, the play-by-play, of course, and I get myself a beer. And I'm coming back to the table for Bob Cole to drop off the rum, and there's Mark Messier sitting with two beautiful women, uh, and they say, hi, Ron. And I said, oh, you must be from Canada. Said, no, Ron, you were at our house party north of Oslo last night. <laughs> I had no idea, you know, how they ended up at, uh, at Gothenburg now. And uh, so Mark, Mark Messier just howls at that. And he says, every man for himself, hey, Ron? And uh, <laughs> crazy type of, uh, frolicking and, you know, it was talk it. And it was, a, it was a formative time in the NHL with lockouts and uh, labor strife. And it's Gretzky and Fedorov and, as I mentioned, Hull and Blake and Kelly Rudy and uh, Grant Fears, the other goals. <laughs> I remember Grant made about 82 saves in the first period alone in Oslo, Norway. Serge Boisvert, former Montreal Canadian, was playing for Norway. He was making fools of our greatest players in the NHL, but that's because they were all partying and having a good time. What about uh, Gary Bettman? I, I think as a kid and even into adulthood, Anytime I heard you were having him sit down with you, mm-hmm. you circled it in a big, all right, that's a date. I'm making sure that I'm, I'm there and I'm watching. Was it the same for you? Were you 
is well, geared for sure. up for that time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that was an issues oriented, much like these conversations about social injustice. That was an issue about justice. That now, in this case, it was management labor relations. Uh, but it was an extreme. I, I've always felt, Sean, that the the whole template of collective bargaining is unfair. But it's interesting because it flipped a little during COVID. They negotiated a deal in which the players actually, I thought, had the leverage. Now, whether they made the best deal, I can't tell you. Um, but I never liked the idea that the players would have to sit out for a year and a half in order to even threaten the billionaire owner because the billionaire owner's business model is so diverse that this is just a, you know, drop in the bucket, this concern over here. So here's a guy trying to negotiate for his livelihood and for his players' rights uh, against an impossible to me uh, situation. But having said that, uh, that was why the challenge of the interviews uh, to represent, um, you know, players are, you know, they're drafted early, they're drafted in, out of midget into the juniors, then they're drafted into the National Hockey League where their salaries capped four ways. There's a team cap, there's an individual cap, um, etc. Uh, these are, these are uh, ethics issues. Extremely important. <laughs> um, these two rows of books over here are all business books. Uh, and, and that is a fascination of mine. Um, but the horse is out of the barn on the bright side. No one has to listen to it anymore because once the cap uh, was won by Gary Bettman in 2005, all bets are off. Uh, you know, th that was the, that was the issue. That was the heart of the argument. Uh, you know, is a cap fair? I felt not. Um, but, the players ultimately, it was their choice, and they they agreed to a cap. And so now they they the only the only snag in that is it really doesn't affect too, too many. But you know, believe it or not, Connor McDavid's underpaid and always will be. Uh, you know, Michael Jordan, geez, Jordan was negotiating thirty three million dollar contracts back in the early nineties. Uh, it, it isn't the best system. It isn't the best system to force business to be accountable and to make more money for the players. Uh, but it, it, you know, no one's going to go home uh, horribly dissatisfied and, or, that's or right. poor. Yeah. What did what did Don have to say when you were when you had a big interview? Oh, with, yeah, he he would stand up. Well, in the old days, Gary and I have been getting along lately because, like I said, the the horse is out of the barn. I really don't have a, any leg to stand on in arguing now. Um, but but in the day when it was contentious and significant, uh, Gary would have Frank Brown as public relations director. He'd have a phone that had a little decibel meter on it, so he'd be sitting there, you know, monitoring the tone of the conversation to ensure that Gary didn't get hysterical. He'd let him know that, that no, 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 Gary, don't, don't look like you're alarmed at this little rat. Uh, and then Bill Daly would be there and uh, John Collins and, you know, the who's who of the National Hockey League office. And right next to them would be grapes staring at me. Don't you screw this up. Don't you go and get fired now because, you know, uh, anyway. So he, <laughs> now you're all going to say, well, he was good to you. Why aren't you good to Don? Yeah, well. I would argue with Bettman. I'll argue with Don about, and Don was not a union guy. You know, he had the appearance of being a union guy. He hated the unions. Don was a how would, guy. How would Don showing up in just like the most absurd suits sometimes? Absolutely yeah. epic, but I mean absurd. And the one that sticks out, and it's funny, I mean, we brought up Kelly a couple times, but is the blue chiffon. Yeah. I, I was <laughs> like, well, when you're standing guy. across from him, were you just like, this is absolutely hysterical? I, I wouldn't even notice a lot of the time. The only time I remember is in Dallas, uh, 99. He came down the, uh, it was a glass elevator through the atrium of a hotel. And he stopped everybody in their tracks. You know, the people in uh, Texas were all looking at like, what the hell is that? Uh, it was a green, lime green suit, top to tail. Uh, but no, I, I, I was oblivious. You know, you're focused like we get on the content and, and not the material, so to speak. Well, I really do appreciate you hopping on. I've kept you for an hour and a half. If uh, I think we'll slide into the final segment. That way we can let you get on with your day. And uh, once again, I'll probably say it 18 million times. I really do appreciate you hopping on. It's, it's been a real honor to sit across from you. But the final segment is the Crude Master Final Five. Just five questions, long or short as you want to go, Ron. I'll try to we'll just try and, try and have a little bit of fun here at the end. Good. So the first one, I know you've had – you know, you mentioned Muhammad Ali. You've had all these people. You've had the greats to sit across from. Is there one guy, maybe past or present, that you would love to sit down and have a chat from, a, a fireside conversation, to use your words? 
Well, I've always had a dream to interview Lewis Lapham, uh, the editor of Harper's Magazine, and he wrote a book called Lights, Camera, Democracy. Uh, I almost had that happen with this In Conversation series. Um, Lewis would be a, a fascinating chat for me. That's a journalist. Um, on, on the athletic side, um, if I was to pick a, an athlete whose brain I would really like to pick right now, um, you know what would be good now is Bobby Orr. Bobby Orr and I should sit down, and that would kind of help to uh, swage uh, a lot of what we've been through with grapes. Cause I know Bobby knows, you know, he was, he said he was hot at me. He didn't mean for that to get out and he was, but uh, it'd be Bobby. Bobby and I are, you know, he, we're different. He doesn't drink. I drink. Um, but you know, there's a great respect uh, there that I would give you that one. Staring at the books you have all sitting everywhere on your shelf. Mm -hmm. Obviously reading is a passion. We figured that out. What is maybe, and I know one is hard to do, but maybe we'll go this way. What is one book that you look back on as being very influential? And then maybe what is one book you're currently reading? Well, <clears throat> from the journalist point of view, that Lights, Camera, Democracy, Lewis H. Lapham, L-A-P-H-A-M is the one. Um, I would say Miriam Taves, a writer from Steinbeck, Manitoba, and her book, All My Puny Sorrows, is one of my uh, most important books. Uh, it's about mental health, suicide. Uh, but just the way she writes. Now, Miriam is an example of someone who can reach you uh, without uh, putting you on the defensive or putting you in a position where, oh, I can't listen to this. It makes me too uncomfortable. She's got a gift. Uh, Miriam Taves, and that's like Jonathan Taves, same spelling. Um, uh, she is fantastic. I, I have a lot of, a lot of these books are uh, about women. Uh, Nula O'Foylan's a writer from Ireland who's gone now, wrote two books, Are You Somebody and Almost There, incredible. Rebecca Solnit wrote a book called Recollections of My Non-Existence, will teach you all you need to know about feminism. Again, not to have everybody fall off their horse, uh, but uh, I, I, I really, really appreciate when I get a book like uh, Recollections of My Non-Existence uh, to teach me why I was so wrong to think that I knew. Mm, the, uh, I'll definitely, uh, I have the... Uh... Lights, camera, democracy, sitting on the bedside table. I'd listen to you talk about it ah. in a different interview. So I've actually started reading it. Uh, anytime a guy such as yourself talks highly of a book like that or the other ones, I think it, uh, well, that's exactly what you want. You want something that's influenced the way you think mm -hmm. because for one person, one book is going to do it. And for another person, another book is going to do it. And if you can find a few of those books, there's, that, there's that book. Sean, sorry to interrupt, but that book yeah. is about him going to work for the, uh, both the CIA and the White House and being given a press release and told to just stick to this release and realizing he could never be that guy. It's like my mother going into the convent and just couldn't stand some of the rules. Um, he, he realized he had to have his own voice uh, and brave and brave and he did it. He, he ended up working for uh, one of the New York dailies and then ended up running Harper's Magazine for decades. So it's a good story about what it is to be a journalist, to be able to step back from the herd and think for yourself. I think that's very good advice. Hockey players call it playing guilty. I'm not sure what us broadcasters talk about, but do you have a playing guilty story where a night yes. got away from you and the next day you had to uh, fight through? Scotiabank Hockey Day in Canada in Winkler. Uh, so this is like training camp for the players. You train all summer and then they show up at training camp and the first day they're so excited to see everybody. They go out and have too many and then they got to do the uh, bike and the uh, O2 testing. For me, I was in Winkler and uh, I was there for three. It's a dry town. Uh, I think you can somehow get booze now, but back in the day, Winkler was dry. And so the fire guys from firefighters from Morden brought us some booze, but Don didn't arrive until the Friday night, the night before the show. And the show goes on the air at, uh, would have gone on the air probably at 11 a.m. in Manitoba and then extends for 13 hours. And Grapes arrives on the Friday and we go to my hotel room and we drink beer and I drank, I don't know what I drank, but too many, too many for a, a 13 hour broadcast on Saturday. And I remember waking up about four hours after I'd gone to sleep and I went to the window and it was minus 45 and howling wind and my whole window in the hotel room was covered in frost. And I took out my, uh, hotel key and I was scraping the frost off to look outside and thought, Oh my God, I'm going to be standing in that frigid cold weather uh, for however many hours tomorrow. And I don't feel very good. I feel like I drank one too many. What has become of you, Ron? That's my guilty story for sure. How about uh, 
success and marriage. You've been married a lot of years now. How have you been able to balance the both of that? Well, lucky again to have an extremely strong Carrie. Um, you know, she's a, she wrote, you know, you hope you don't marry your mother, uh, but I, I, <laughs> I found a lot of the values in Carrie, the, the strength of her. She's a great organizer. She runs hockey teams both in the summer and in the winter. Um, loves the game. That, that, that helps, obviously. Um, we just love a lot of the same things. We're, uh, we love to travel. We, we love to make a nice meal and have some drinks with the, you know, one, one while barbecuing and maybe a glass of wine while eating dinner. Once in a while, get carried away. Um, but yeah, she's just a, you know, she's got her, do, uh, her master's, I should say, in parks and rec. Uh, so she's committed herself. Uh, we have no children. We had bad luck with miscarriages and, uh, that that's an interesting twist in my life too, right? Sean is a, you know, when you're not a parent, you don't understand some of that. You mentioned the bar fight. Well, the same goes for your kids, right? You would, you would kill for your children. Uh, and so conversations about uh, egalitarian approaches don't always cut it with a parent or someone in a bar with a friend. Um, but, you know, in Carrie's case, uh, she is really good on, uh, on listening to the wisdom of, of these ideologies, uh, these attempts to go beyond those sort of bare bones base reactions. I think that's, that's what's made our relationship click, uh, blessedly. Your final one, and this is a selfish one. I always look for, especially from guys of your level, what's, what's the best piece of advice you can give anyone who's starting out in media or um, your line of work? Well, for sure, Wayne Berry was the guy that taught me that rule about 10 hours of prep. Prep is huge. That gives you a little bit of confidence. Uh, it's like anything else. When you go into something knowing you're well-armed, that, that's a great feeling. Um, I, I think, you know, to find yourself uh, is to, to um, speak to the way you feel about things. And that's what you've done in this interview, Sean. You know, you, you were probably a bit sheepish to say, I can't stand what Trudeau's doing, or I can't stand that Don was let go. But you gave yourself to to the moment and that that's authenticity it, you have to do that you you can't fear you know putting on a front for ron because of what ron might think um, so you're already there uh, but i for a younger broadcaster it's to always speak one-to-one -one, not hey everybody hi canada or hello millions of viewers and don't even think in those terms you're not doing it for a million you're doing it for one person and that one person has your sensibility your politics your humor uh, your ethics that's the only way you'll be sincere. That's, that's, that's a key. Well, thank you very much, sir, for hopping on. This has been, they say sometimes meeting your idols isn't what it's built up to be, but this has been an absolute pleasure. I've certainly enjoyed having you on for uh, a little shy of two hours, but it's, it's been an absolute pleasure and I wish you nothing but the best of luck and the things to come. And I know we laugh, we didn't talk about hockey, but uh, I certainly look forward to seeing you back on, you know, hopefully the Oilers uh, going deep into a playoff run. Really appreciate it as well, Sean. Total treat. Hey folks, thanks again for joining us today. If you just stumble on the show and like what you hear, please click subscribe. Remember, every Monday and Wednesday, a new guest will be sitting down to share their story. The Sean Newman Podcast is available for free on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever else you find your podcast fix. Until next time.